Okay, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Harani, and as a member of the Executive Committee of the New York City Bar Association Senior Lawyers Committee, I'm honored to introduce today's event and our esteemed global panelists. We thank you so much for joining us. And at the New York City Bar Senior Lawyers Committee, we believe that anybody who invites change invites disruption. And that is honorable work to disrupt the status quo for meaningful transformation from a legacy of oppression to a legacy of justice. Today's event is going to bring together incredible activists from around the world for an open discussion of what it means to decolonize law and how the intersections of health justice, racial justice, and international law overlap to impact our lived experiences. We'll be exploring critical current events, including the human rights crisis in Iran, bodily autonomy and women's rights, and white saviorism versus sovereignty. We're working to gain a greater understanding of how we can shift out of a legacy of oppression into a legacy of justice. I'm so thankful for our panelists for agreeing to this event, and I cannot wait for you to meet them. We have Alasso Olivia, a social worker by profession, born and raised in Jinja, Uganda, who founded the Black African woman-led community organization, No White Saviors, to create awareness and educate on the white savior industrial complex and its effects on the African continent. Joining us from Uganda as well is Robert Okot, an advocate of the High Court in Uganda who specializes in human rights law, nonprofit law, and corporate law. He's an advocate in several leading human rights cases and is also the attorney for the No White Saviors organization. Calling in all the way from Australia is Huda Soyen, an international PhD student and lecturer originally from Pakistan. Her research focuses on gender-based violence, female general cutting, human rights issues, and political activism. She recently taught a course on indigenous communities and the intersection of white possession and its impact on the socioeconomic conditions and future generations. And our final panelist is Priscilla Kunku Hoivedo, a human rights jurist and advocate based in Sierra Leone, West Africa. She's a filmmaker and the founder and creative director of the Collective for Black Iranians. Finally, I would like to extend a thank you to the following co-sponsoring committees at the New York City Bar Association, the Health Law, Inter-American Affairs, Middle Eastern and North African Affairs, Civil Rights, Foreign and Comparative Law, Immigration and Nationality Law, Mental Health Law, Social Welfare Law, and Bioethical Issues. One of the things I love most about our collaborations and our work at the New York City Bar Association is this intersectionality among committees. If you're interested in events like this one, I hope you can consider joining us at the Senior Lawyers Committee as intergenerational engagement is critical to furthering our work and legacy. I'm gonna be posting some links in the chat to connect you with our speakers and as well as our Senior Lawyers mission statement if you're interested in learning more, but feel free to ignore the chat for now as we turn it over to our speakers. I'd like to introduce each of the speakers with a little bit about their history, who they are, and why they got to the place that they are. So, Alasso, Olivia, I'd love to start with you and hear a bit about your story as a young child and how you got to founding No White Saviors. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. <clears throat> Let me hope everyone can hear me so well. As Jacqueline has mentioned, my name is Alas Olivia Patience. I am the founder of No White Saviors and the executive director of Sankara Pan African Library in Uganda, Kampala. My story is a very interesting story and I'm privileged and honored to be sharing it with you. I grew up um, from a town, I was born in a town called Jinja, and Jinja is in the eastern part of Uganda. It is also the home of the longest river in the world. That's the River Nile. And uh, it is also, it happens to be a home or a community of very many white people. So growing up as a child in this hometown of my ginger, I always saw very many white people on the streets of Jinja, in different places, at swimming pools, on the roads, and more often at school when we were still little, 
we would have white people visit our school. And what I remember that time is that they would gather us together and asked us to sing or clap hands. And we would receive, they would bring literally small toys and Bibles for us. And I never really understood that. But as a child, I, I had my own mindset. I, I knew white people were God's chosen people. There were people that were next to God because they were the same people that were bringing Jesus to our schools to our you know, communities. So that is the mindset that I grew up with. And also going to the church, I often saw Jesus's you know, photos white and also Jesus on the cross in my church is still white up to now. So that was the narrative of me growing up thinking, oh, so these are already chosen by God. So we have to listen to them like, cause that's the narrative and that's the whole scenario that was created a, 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 a around my childhood. So, um, but living along that side, when it came to me as a person, I always wanted to um, help the community. I come from um, an in a middle-class um, family. And so there were so many things that I would see that were, you know, uh, growing up quite different from other people. So I wanted to be closer. I wanted to be next to the community. I, and I said, okay, what can keep me close to my community? And so I went to do social work and um, from school um, as a social worker, I joined the NGO sector. And when I joined the NGO sector, I worked with different NGOs. But during my work with these organizations, there were so many things that I would see. And also during my work, it was also a quest of answering, getting the answers to my childhood, you know, mysteries that I, you know. And when I started pulling the dots together, joining the NGO as, as a case manager and a senior social worker. These were just titles that were given to me um, by uh, my white bosses because in so many occasions, the organizations that I worked with were you know, founded by white people in my community. And so with my work, I, I faced so many challenges because they would want to give you the solutions to your community and you would see the power dynamic in play, like, okay, you're just a social worker. What are you telling me? I am the founder of this big organization. Like literally I'm helping your people. I'm sacrificing to be in your country or in your community. That was really, really heavy for me. I, you know, I experienced that, but in most cases, my reaction back to that was always, you know, um, it was always a negative one. I would push back and say, you know what? We, we know our communities, we have the best solutions. But um, since in these organizations uh, that I worked in, I did not have the power, I was not anyone to address these issues because every time you confront whiteness, every time you confront white supremacy, there'll always be a reaction, a burst out on you. There'll always be, oh, you are just so disrespectful. You're just, um, you, you're not grateful that we are helping your people. So after seeing also um, things like the, the syndicate, the, that whole um, deceit in the adoption industry as well, and seeing how uh, Ugandan children were being shipped or uh, exported to the United States mainly because it, it is one of the countries that ranks on you know the adoption list and and also getting into the depth of understanding that these children were not total orphans they had family but you find that many people and I'll say predominantly white people are ones who adopt on the continent we all know this you would see that um I saw there was this um sell out in these organizations. And so with all these things mixed up and I did not have the power as well to change anything, I, I had so many thoughts. And also the fact that at one point um, I was working in an organization where I was forced to say, that I saw my fellow you know, colleague, a black man steal money, which I didn't because I, he was not given the physical money. It was more of um, 
a, fa a facilitation to the field, but I was put in the room by white women and asked to say that the only, if you just say that you saw him steal the money, you keep your job. And, and that was it for me. And I think that was one of my turning points. I went back home. I told them I would actually think about it. So I went back home and just started reflecting back and saying, I don't think I'm in this, I'm, I'm ready to do this. I don't think, and I don't know what my conscience will be 10 years from, you know, making that decision. Um, so I walked back and then um, I handed in my resignation later and I said, no, look, whatever you're asking me to do, I fix my conscience. And so I am, I'm off. I, you can get someone else that can replace me. But um, when I left the organization and I came back home, I started thinking of how many people are going through the same situation, but they have no uh, way to air it out because at the end of the day, um, as a mother, as you know, as someone that is, um, my family expects to help to, um, to, to send in help, how many people are, would keep quiet, like would go quiet on that. And so I, um, I said there has to be a way of helping people out. There oh, sorry, there has to be um, a way of helping other Ugandans, other people that are going through the same, that are experiencing the attack of the white savior industrial complex, that are being um, are put in positions that are, for, are just props. And so um, I, I decided to take a break. I decided to sit down and reflect and say, you know what, enough is enough. Um, these conversations need to be had. These uh, challenges that uh, women like me or black people like me go through in these organizations need to be addressed. And it is not at a local level, but I'm sure even at the international level, we, we still see that people go through what I went through. So as a collective uh, with a few friends, we started talking about the things that we had seen in my hometown that were just not being addressed. Everyone was just so quiet. Everyone was scared of you know, um, losing their job. Everyone was scared of not talking about um, these organizations, not talking about these people, not talking about the white people that were, you know, uh, doing all these things. And so we came up and started bringing out scenarios, the different um, cases that we saw. For example, in, in my hometown of Jinja, there happened to be a woman, an American um, Christian missionary with the names of Renee Back. She, she went and treated Ugandan children under 105 died under her care. And so we brought such, such uh, conversations back to life. And then we came up with the hashtag, no white saviors, and it started on um, Facebook. And we said, okay, so it's now on Facebook. Let's take this conversation further uh, to other platforms. And then we started the no white saviors platform um, no, I said with Instagram page that you all see um, that is about 800,000 followers at the moment. And we've shifted the conversations from um, my hometown of Jinja now to an international and global level where I knew that there are other people that are going through the same thing, that are going through this injustice, that are going through um, this, you know, the white savior, you know, syndicate. And then um, when we started the No White Saviors and started talking about these conversations, we had people, we had a massive reaction from all over the world. And I just said in my heart that these were conversations that were needed like yesterday. These were things that we needed to talk about. And so it is at the right time that we are talking about these issues. And um, they just didn't start from Olivia. They started centuries ago from the slavery, from you know, the racial injustices. And so when, when you see this page right now, it's, it's talking about the global issues. It's talking about all the injustices. And that is where we are with my white saviors at the moment. Jacqueline, I'd love to give chance to the other speakers to 
um, to introduce. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, thank you so much, and and that ties in perfectly with uh, Robert Ocot. You were part of the uh, advocacy for the case about the missionary with um, these children who were dying in this. Uh, sort of pretend hospital without any medical license or anything and the exploitation that happened there. And I'd love to hear more about um, your development in these uh, human rights cases in nonprofit law and how you got to be connected to No White Saviors as the attorney for this organization. Uh, thank you very much, Jackie, and uh, the rest of the panelists. Uh, Olivia has spoken so well about uh, the work of no white saviors in trying to fight uh, the white savior complex, not only in Uganda, but also across the globe. Now, that particular case that uh, Olivia talked about, uh, an American woman called Rene Buck, who started out uh, with a feeding program in the eastern part of Uganda. Uh, but later on, became adventurous on Ugandan kids by setting up an illegal health facility. Not only just setting up an illegal health facility, but also practicing medicine, yet she was only a college dropout in America. But what does that situation bring out? It again takes us back to the idea of white savior complex, because the narrative that has been pushed out there is that all that is white is all knowing, all wealthy, as opposed to all that is black being poor, ignorant, which is not necessarily true. Because we've seen very many white people that are ignorant and very poor. But because of that color that gives them that privilege in communities, most especially in our communities that have been lied to, to believe that whoever is white is all knowing and all wealthy. So as a result of her ventures in Uganda, we had a number of families suffer from human rights violations because she presented herself as the person that would save them from their dire situations. And what is more annoying about, again, that case, Jackie, is that these kids would be touted from proper government health facilities that have proper medics and brought to her facility that only had about one or two medics, but were not allowed to do their work as medics, but instead, the white woman would perform medical procedures even in the presence of those professional medical practitioners. That is how bad white saviorism can be. But personally, I've come to appreciate again a number of things with my work with uh, the no white saviors. I've had to work on cases that have missionary workers abusing Ugandan or Ugandan children, either sexually or in terms of exploiting them. You have international adoptions happening on the basis of the scourge of white saviors because you you have someone investing over $60,000 in just one adoption on, in the guise of trying to help that family. But 
for someone who is really interested in helping that family could probably donate that money to the family. However, because the intention is to take away this child from their biological family and disenfranchise them from that, so you end up seeing a number of these adoptions happening, but also a lot of criminality happening as a result. Because some of these adoptions are not, many of them are not in good faith. Children are taken out for organs, internal organs. There is a lot of fraud that happens as a result. For those of you that may have followed recently, the FBI and the FBI had a number of people sanctioned because of their fraudulent actions as regards to international adoptions. So those are some of the things that I've kept on learning, but also increasingly interested me in fighting against the scourge of white saviorism. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, it is awful that we are um, still seeing constantly issues like this that um, are, are deeply offensive to our sense of humanity and to a sense of justice. And I think as we continue the conversation um, about white saviorism versus sovereignty, about the power dynamics, about the uh, white savior industrial complex and uh, the intersection of these pieces of health justice, racial law, international law, because you're at the heart, as you said, you're not just talking about local issues, but these intersect with international law issues of, of across countries and the inherent colonization that is continuing um, I, I'm looking forward to us, us diving deeper in here. But before we do that, I want to make sure we hear as well a bit of the lens and story from our two other panelists. So um, I invite you, Huda, to uh, introduce a bit about how you have come to focus on bodily autonomy, on um, a female genital cutting and your particular lens as an international student coming from Pakistan, studying in Australia, um, your connection here to focusing on those issues uh, and what you feel is, is important in the lens that you are taking to your work. Thank you, Jacqueline, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, so first off, I think while growing up, um, I was raised in a conservative Islamic household. And I did notice that, especially in a Pakistani household, there is a lot of um, shame, uh, honor, and um, avoidance attached to the female form and uh, the female body in general. So whether it's menstruation, whether it is something to do with genitals um, and even pregnancy, it's usually these are things that are hidden and not talked about, not in the family, and especially not in front of men. Um, and I found that a bit odd and I would question it. And that's how I led to, um, I, I kind of came across the topic of female, female genital mutilation which is also known as female genital cutting, and in some cultures is also known as female circumcision. I was reading the Reader's Digest, I was around 11 years old, and I found out that um, there was this woman who had been cut, and then she'd migrated to a Western country, and this happened in Africa. So the general notion surrounding this topic was that this only happens in Africa. This does not happen anywhere else. And that's something that I heard while growing up. After completing my undergrad and my master's, I kind of touched upon the topic again, and I started trying to find leads if this happens in other areas. And what I found out was that it does happen in India as well, especially within a minority community. And that minority community is also in Pakistan. 
And I found out, okay, this practice exists and still happens in Pakistan. It is usually performed on young girls between the ages of usually six to seven. But according to my current qualitative data, it also varies. Sometimes it's five years old, sometimes it's 10 years old, and sometimes vacation cutting happens. So if some families live abroad, like in the States or Australia or the UK or other countries, they come back to the home country, Pakistan, and they get the girls cut and then they go back. So I was interested in finding out more about this because I know that there's not a lot of discussion around the female form. And if there is, it is sometimes, um, it carries patriarchal or misogynistic undertones. And there's nothing that really dives into an academic or a research perspective. So I started looking through data and I tried to find out if there is any gray literature. I found that there is very little gray literature, a few blogs, a few websites, and they started emerging the first time around 2011. So that's, I guess, not long ago. So I thought that, okay, maybe Pakistan is a bit far behind. There is not a lot of awareness surrounding this topic. And um, I guess for good reason, because our culture uh, does not really encourage these conversations. And the more I started digging in, the more I found that there's a huge research gap. And that's why I decided to pursue my research, which explores female genital cutting in Pakistani society from a very Pakistani context. And it also explores its political invisibility, how the government and even non-governmental agencies or governmental agencies have not acknowledged this practice, have not talked about it. And one of the reasons is because there people don't actually know it's happening because the majority of the population in Pakistan um, sect wise and religion wise is Sunni. And I think among a lot of Sunnis, this practice does not take place, but that's yet to be explored as well. I think everything, there's always a maybe and what if, unless you know it's been explored. So I thought this was the perfect time and the perfect topic to actually explore and understand the woman's bodily autonomy. Why does this practice take place? And so far, um, um, off the record, talking to the women in the community and engaging with them and a lot of my friends, I understood that it takes place because it is seen as a religious marker, uh, but other sects, other Islamic sects do not agree with this. So only this particular sect practices it. And it is also seen as a community marker, an identifier by some women. Um, and what I'm also exploring is universalism, the human rights perspective of this, how this is a violation of a child's uh, bodily autonomy, and also how cultural relativists, like um, a few relativists out there, like I think Schwader or Fuan by Ahmadou, they speak about how this practice is a part of their culture and there should not be anything stopping people from practicing this. There's been a lot of comparison to male circumcision as well, but I think that's another debate for another day. Overall, I think what it does highlight is that there is some form of control and there is some form of definition to women's bodies and female children's bodies as well by the men in society, especially in Pakistani society as well. And um, that's why I was encouraged to choose this topic Moving away from this topic, I also do explore notions that have to do with shame and honor and the way the woman's body is interpreted, how it navigates through public and private spheres as well, especially in a conservative society like ours, which is primarily dominated by ease of movement and accessibility of, of men and less that of women. And just recently, a few years ago now, young girls and women, um, they're, they're like on motorbikes uh, uh, going around the city. And that was seen as scandalous. Like, how can women um, be on motorbikes? And um, it was seen as something that was not something they should do because often society thinks that they have a hold and a say um, in how women should not only dress and move around, but what they should have accessibility to as well. Um, I also uh, like exploring the class structure, how from middle class to lower middle class and even societies that are, do not have access to basic resources, how 
the interpretation of bodily autonomy varies and culture varies as well. Even within one culture, there are subcultures. And the other thing that I usually try exploring is why there is classism within the feminist activist movement in Pakistan as well, and how that is also separated from Western feminism. So those are a few things that I usually do look at and how neocolonial structures, I think also through nonprofit agencies, I think like uh, Okut Robert and Alasa Olivia patients mentioned that there are these white structures or or uh, sponsors and funding structures that have a lot of say even in South Asia and Indian and Pakistani communities as well. Um, and they think they know our problems. They think they know us, but actually it requires the community involvement for any, let's say change to happen or any improvement or progress to happen. Um, but yeah, I will let the other speaker talk, but there's so much to say about, I think the neo-colonial structure and especially a lot of things that Oka Robert mentioned are quite relevant to things that I tutored in this past semester. So yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Hara. And, and I am looking forward to continuing that uh, deep dive and lens for our audience as well. Uh, Priscilla, I am looking forward, especially as uh, Hoda brought up these issues of bodily autonomy, women's rights, um, local identities. You have done so much work to bring the uh, human storytelling piece to light, to uh, identify the existence and um, uh, create awareness of the Black Iranian identity, which from white supremacy has been nearly eradicated as this is not something that actually exists and um, have been working to share the stories of individuals um, along the way. And I'd love to hear more about the founding of the Collective for Black Iranians, how you got to this and um, what else you'd like to share at this point. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for I mean, all the other panelists for everything that you've shared so far. I've been following a lot of the work of Snow White Savior for a very long time, and it's wonderful discovering the work of Hoda. Can't wait to just learn more. So yes, I <clears throat> was born in a city called Tours in France, and then life happened that my Iranian mother um, had to move back to Iran during the war. Um, that was in the 80s, the war with Saddam Hussein. And so I grew up uh, part of my childhood in Iran and then um, went back to, to Europe and continued going to Iran every year for five months where I was raised by my grandparents, my Iranian, um, non-Black Iranian uh, grandparents. And um, living in Tehran um, under the Islamic Republic, which at the time was its uh, first decade since the revolution had happened in 1979, I did not um, live before, I did not know Iran before the Islamic Republic. I've only experienced and known Iran as an Iranian um, under the Islamic Republic. And uh, uh, it has been a very isolating experience for most of my life where I had to justify who I am. I had to speak um, over people who thought they knew better than me who I should be. Um, and uh, obviously most times it would be folks who hold Western citizenships who would tell me where I should where I belong and where my opinion should go, um, but also people from my region, which is um, you know Middle East, Swana, um, uh, Southwest uh, Asia, and and so forth, where there are no conversations about racial um, dynamics and histories and stories, um, but yet we exist, you know, within the Middle Eastern context, we exist within Iranian diaspora, we exist within the Iranian. Um, reality under the Islamic Republic, Black folks, folks of African descent, um, folks who come from several intersections on top of being Iranian. Um, one can be of Arab descent, one can be of African descent, one can be of um, Indian descent. And uh, your experiences as an Iranian navigating Iranian realities are going to be very different than, uh, you know, folks who have different ethnicities or perhaps the a part like my own Iranian side of the family of the predominant quote unquote Persian, um, most, most of the time uh, white or white passing or non-black um, identities. So 
having conversations about race or about my blackness started with my family as a kid in Tehran and with my schoolmates and with the guy selling non sangak at the at the corner store where I would go get bread with my granddad. I always would get reactions to my blackness. In Tehran, one must know that you barely even see blackness. You don't really see black folks in cities like Tehran or Mashhad or Isfahan and many other cities in Iran. One has to go more so in the southern parts of Iran, um, what is called the Bandari region, which is bordering the Persian Gulf. And uh, there you find populations of African descent, population of Arab descent, population of Indian descent. But yet there's no conversations about it. It's the it's uh, the stories are not shared, our point of view are not considered, and they are just we are just um, kind of put together under the same you know Iranian identity and Muslim identity and whatever else they believe as the state, the Islamic Republic. You know we should call ourselves, and in the same way, um, the same reasoning actually is, is replicated in most of my community where. You would hear a lot of folks in Iran, in the Iranian diaspora, in the US or in Europe or in the region, even if you go to Lebanon or you go to other countries in the region, if you come and say, I'm black and Iranian, folks will say, we don't have black and white here. This is the Middle East. These are things from America. You're an American child. I was not born in the US. I only went to America when I went to NYU law. And I don't know if that counts as turning American. I don't think so. But um, you know, I knew I was black before I ever set foot in the U.S. Obviously, and um, I knew I was black in Iran because folks would call me, you know, black seal in Farsi on the street when I go get bread every day, several times a day. People would just heckle at me um, in Farsi seal, which is the literal translation for black in English, and also a reference to the color of your skin in my language. So whether or not they meant the N-word or whether or not they meant black literally is based on how it was heckled at me and how I experienced it as a black kid at the time. I was frequently stopped by the police who always thought that I was a foreigner, that there was no way I could be Iranian even though I spoke fluent and lived there. And just a general misunderstanding about what Iranian can be and how diverse we can be. And of course, all that within the context of heavy censorship, of um, curtails, just the, 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 the restrictions of lots of basic freedom, just, just a lot of uh, restriction of um, basic rights. Having conversations about race in Iran is, is considered as some sort of ideology, is considered as us pushing for separatism, it's considered as us creating divisions, as if the color of my skin and all the experiences that stem from them was something that I only imagine in my own um, in my own psyche and not something that is actually happening every, in my everyday Iranian experience. So it's based on all these experiences of, uh, you know, of ignorance of being asked, are you black because you stayed in the sun too long up until as an adult, I'm still asked those questions often when I go back to Iran in, in, in you know, it happens also in the capital city. Uh, I mean, uh, ignorance doesn't have a particular zip code. Um, unfortunately, it's quite global, and so is anti-blackness, and um, so is colonization. Um, most people, just when they discuss um, African histories or African descendant histories, they're mostly um, not even realizing or aware of such histories only from a Western perspective and a Western lens. So we talk about the Atlantic slave trade. We talk about we talk about you know stories of. Um, of enslavement and of migration, also chosen migration on this side of the of the of the ocean, but we never even are aware of the Trans-Saharan slave trade, of the Persian Gulf slave trade, of the fact that Turkey was one of the last countries in the world, if not the last, to abolish the slave trade in the 1930s, and that Iran abolished the the Persian Gulf slave trade in 1929. So practically yesterday, if you then you know start thinking about other countries and their abolition. Um, of, of such practices. Now, you know, for, for me with the collective, it, it, it came, this idea came with me as a kid. I wanted to have the possibility to discuss who I am, to talk about people calling me Sioh on the street and not be hushed, not be told that this is not happening here because we don't have black and white by non-black folks. And, uh, you know, it was um, the very deep desire, but also the frustration and the rage and the, the harm of um, not getting, having the opportunity for my histories and my points of view to be counted. I, I couldn't find echo in my experiences. It's as if everything that had happened from 
when my hair is searched, when I go to travel domestically in Iran because I'm a black woman and because big curly hair or braids like this one, I may be hiding something dangerous. So the weaponization of, of, of my identity and absolute silence and censorship and ignorance in the region about the way that you know, blackness is associated with lesser than, with uh, less beautiful, with um, more sexual, with so many other extremely harmful um, projections by a lot in the community that were formed because of the absence of dialogues. So the collective bo was born out of this pain, was born out of this frustration and was born out of the necessity to finally hear from people instead of hearing of people's opinions, you know, and quote unquote expertise, just centering people's stories and hearing, you know, this is my story. Maybe perhaps another Afro-Iranian, another Black Iranian person who's a man, who's a non-binary, who's queer, who's whatever, has a different ex ex experience within the community in Iran, in another city. When I started going to the South, I started experiencing a different, um, a different reality uh, with my identity uh, in Iran as a, as a Black woman. And so it, it was born, you know, as a village, truly. So I, I, it was an effort where I brought lots of different folks uh, coming from different intersections and um, with the goal of sharing stories from the past, such as uh, stories of forced migration, um, with the abolition in 1929, stories of chosen migration with folks coming from um, Africa and, and, and its greater region for economic opportunities to the Persian Gulf and decided to stay. Truly just sharing stories for people to see how we're actually connected to one another in our histories and how much we can learn from where we want to go. And then there was September 16th with the murder of Gina Marceau Khomeini by under the while under the custody of um, of the so-called morality police Basiji. Um, she was arrested uh, when she was visiting Tehran from her Kurdish hometown of Sakez. And um, she was arrested under the pretense, for all pretense, that her hijab was not proper, even though she was wearing a veil. She was wearing the, the compulsory hijab, which is um, if you, once you reach Bulur, which is puberty, uh, under Sharia law, you must cover as, as a girl woman or somebody being seen as such by society, such as the Iranian Islamic Republic society. So, it, 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 um, the work of the collective then became really centering the stories of those who are fighting for freedom, for those who are fighting for basic rights, the right to choose who you are, how you want to discuss who you are, the right to your body and what you want to do with it. Um, would you like to put some bright nail polish today or will you be arrested by the morality police because the nail polish is too bright? What is the standard to know if it's too bright or not bright enough and how can one be sure that you will not be facing excessive state police violence? Well, the reality being that the Islamic Republic has been an oppressive system for over 43 years, and that just now the world is seeing you know, the tipping point of it. And the collective is making sure that the conversation continues centering the margins, continues centering stories of women and girls, stories of the LGBTQ in Iran, stories of uh, uh, folks of any, any descent, all folks, and what they're fighting for right now um, in Iran. Thank you, Priscilla, for the in overview of, of your story, of the work that you're doing. And it just brought to mind so much how through all of your stories, this idea of sovereignty just keeps coming to my mind. And the, uh, um, I don't know how to call it, but like there's white saviorism and white supremacy on one hand interfering with the identity of sovereignty. And in each of the lenses and roles and works that you're all looking at, you're seeing this white savior complex coming in to try to exploit, oppress, um, uh, be the hero in ways that aren't actually working and helping. Um, and so I'm very interested to see the continuing conversation um, around the idea of decolonizing law, what that means for us. But Robert Alcott, I see you have your hand raised. And at this point, uh, we're shifting towards this more free flowing conversation. So feel free to raise your hand if you want going forward, but you're also welcome each of you to unmute and speak directly to each other. So Robert, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Jacqueline. 
uh, I heard Huda making a very important uh, argument. And uh, one of the things uh, she said was that when she was starting her study on FGM, she had the mind or she, she had been told that uh, most of these bad things were happening in Africa. But just to reassure her that that is not something new. There have been deliberate efforts to portray people on the continent as being barbaric, dark. Just look at the conversation about homophobia. Uh, right now, everyone looks at Africa as the most homophobic continent. But the one thing that people forget is that homophobia is a legacy of colonialism. And again, people again forget that before colonialism, African traditions or African communities were tolerant to same-sex relations. It is until the advent of colonialism that we have very homophobic legislations being introduced to the continent. But today, homophobia is all placed on the people on the continent. Just here in Uganda, there are some cultures where women are addressed with male titles. Isn't that tolerance? But also, there have been traditional leaders that have been identified as homosexuals. However, they were still tolerated within their communities. But today the conversation has been turned the other way around to portray the continent as the most barbaric and inhuman as regards to tolerating people that identify as LGBTQ. LGBTQ. The other issue that uh, Huda talked about was regarding body autonomy and the urge to control women's bodies. I would like to say that those are again ideas of capitalism and its urge to control bodies. And as we may be aware, capitalism and white supremacy are identical twins. And white supremacy is a result of colonialism. So when you see certain things happening, for instance, uh, the movement against the right to choice, abortion rights, all those are results of white supremacy, capitalism and their urge to control bodies. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, would it be okay to say, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, a lot of points that um, Robert Ocote made. Thank you so much. I think even with regards to um, fluidity and sexuality, um, I'm not that well versed, I'm still learning a lot. But when we go back to South Asian history as well, before the partition of Pakistan, India and Bangladesh, um, and before, um, uh, before the British actually came and colonized and invaded the lands. Um, there are a lot of stories and some historical references that there was a lot more sexual fluidity there um, compared to when the troops came in, when the English came in and the British came in. And I think they were somehow maybe disgusted by that sense of fluidity. And there was quite a lot of oppression after that, especially for the um, even for the Khwaja Sarar community, which is uh, slowly gaining a lot of traction in Pakistan as well. 
Um, it's been a community that's existed uh, since a long time um, in Pakistan and in India, and I'm sure in a lot of other places. Uh, so to that point and continuing to another one where capitalism and uh, um, whether it's white saverism or colonialism and also white supremacy, they go hand in hand, I believe, the history back to when there was a shift away from the church and Protestantism and a lot of value placed in what people can do, how much they can work, uh, which obviously gave traction to the system, the socioeconomic system of capitalism. Um, and putting that in reference, I think, it is, there is truth to this, that we are all stuck in the cycle of capitalism, which was influenced and introduced and brought by the West, as far as my knowledge goes. And keeping that in mind, we've been, we're kind of surrounded and contained by these systems. And we have only that, I'm, I'm trying to make this as articulate as I can at this, in this moment. There is a, a scholar, Aileen Mortson, Morton Robertson, and uh, she explains how even with indigenous culture and communities, we are only left sometimes with the English language and the certain structures of social sciences to explain these concepts and philosophies. Uh, because that's all that is created, um, a Western academic educational system, the school system, um, maybe even assembly line production, all these concepts. So they are um, a product of colonialism. They are a product of the Western system and Western capitalism. And like Robert Ogut mentioned that this notion that these bad things are coming from bad things apparently are coming from Africa or African regions and it's barbaric. This is actually also something that I think obviously needs to be addressed. And while studying for about the topic of female genital mutilation, I realized that back in the seventies and especially um, um, in American circles, American academia and uh, uh, Western feminism back then, there was a lot, there were a lot of negative connotations and there was a lot of negativity surrounding uh, not only this topic, but attributing it only and solely to African communities and blaming the mothers and saying that it's barbaric. And I think Fran Hoskin has recently, like in a lot of recent work um, that focuses on cultural contextualization as well, it tries to hold Fran Hoskin accountable that she did bring in this narrative that um, it's barbaric of African communities to have this practice, when in essence, every community, I believe, has one practice or the other that might be questioned by us. And I don't think a whole community should be held accountable or um, persecuted for it. And I think that's a good point that uh, Robert made, that it, it's always, there's there are these negative attributions made. And this narrative, it does come from a neo-colonial approach. It comes from a neo-colonial structure and Western academia, even to the point like when we're studying in class and even the languages we speak and the way we are defining terms and systems that is heavily influenced also, I think, by the West. Um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you so much, Huda and Robert. Uh, Priscilla, you come next. I just wanted to react to what Priscilla talked about earlier when she moves and she has gone back to Tehran in Iran when she's on the streets and she's called, you know, black, like, you know, people that she, she considers to be um, a countryman and you walk on the street and someone calls you black. And now that takes me also to a very um, recent example. Last, um, I think three days, the whole of Africa was looking at Morocco being one of the remaining teams on the World Cup, but it is so heartbreaking that um, one of the players on the Morocco team wrote an Instagram post literally saying this win is for the Arab world and for Moroccans. This shows you 
uh, um, this shows you the heat of um, white supremacy, like people don't even want to associate themselves with anything that is black because the hierarchy of whiteness for you to be human, for you to be um, uh, a fully human being, you have to be white. That is the standard. And these are laws that were formulated way back centuries ago when white people owned slaves, when white people owned black people. So this, this um, internalized operation is just killing the continent. I was very, very disturbed because I watched the game and I was one of the people screaming. But when I saw that post, I, I got so I got to this mood and I was like, wow, it is 2022 and someone can send an Instagram like that. And Morocco is in the north of Africa. So when we are talking about decolonization, there is a lot that has to be done. There is a lot that we need to be looking at because um, things are happening every day. Just that recent thing. Two, two days ago, after the championship, showed me the position of um, of um, of white supremacy in the world. And so, if we're going to embark on the decolonial journey, then there is a lot to be done within ourselves as well. Because if someone can do, I mean, I'm still. Ooh, I, I had to share this, but it's still not only me, but there's so many people on the continent as well. No, I think, uh, thank you so much for bringing this up, Olivia. I think it's, um, you know, for someone like me who stands at this intersection of being from the Middle East, of being African, of being born in, in, in a Western city and then having spent, I mean, I'm living in, in an African city right now. I'm in Freetown, um, Sierra Leone, in West Africa. And what's, uh, what I think as, as minoritized voices, black and brown voices and indigenous people, what we really need to also do is to take ownership of how we perpetrate those systems of oppression. You don't need to go to Paris to or to New York or to the US or to the West at all to experience anti-blackness and system of oppression. You can go to Morocco, you can live in Africa in any predominantly black African country, you will experience a lot of anti-blackness, a lot of systems of oppression, because simply of a lack of consciousness around, you know, our black identities, our histories, and how they come and and, and situate themselves with with um, whiteness alongside whiteness. If you take countries from the Maghreb region, if you take countries like Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, Saudi, Lebanon, we don't talk about race. Yet it is heavily he colorism and anti-blackness is huge. You watch Bollywood film, the darker skinned folks are the dangerous and angry people. I should know Bollywood films make it in the black market, quote unquote, look at my language, on the market in Iran. And you know, I would have to look at women who are blue-eyed, like Ashawara Ali and so many other actresses, and same with their co-lead co actors. And then the angry mother or you know, the mean person is gonna be a darker person, a browner person. We also know about how um, the society is divided in, in, in India based on colorism, based on you know, uh, the color of your skin. But yet we don't talk about, we don't talk about that. We just find other reasons for it, you know, impoverishment. Um, we found reasons like war, conflict, you know, uh, as if it wasn't people that experienced lives, you know, in the same way that people walking in the streets of Dublin or, you know, of um, other countries would experience. I think there is also in this discourse, when it comes to decolonizing, there is this focus only on the fact that this is coming from the West and us, in this other part of the world, we're just suffering from it. Well, it's not exactly true. There are systems of oppression from the West that have been adopted in our Swana communities, in our African communities, and are every day being perpetrated by, by brown and black folks, by the way that, you know, the, the way that they think what is more beautiful, that it's, it's fair, that's more beautiful. I mean, uh, uh, skin lightening uh, is bleaching is a huge, huge, uh, phenomena in, in, in Swana, in countries like India, Pakistan, Iran, so many countries. And yet we pretend that we don't see race. We pretend that, 
you know, but it's not the same that in America, it's not as bad. We don't talk about it. So how do we know if it's not as bad if we never even have dialogue around it? When we bring race or even the simple fact of anti-blackness or racism, um, discrimination based on the color of your skin, based on the fact that you're perceived as African in Iran, people call you Ethiopia on the street. Ethiopia, 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 when they see a black person. You know, I mean, how, what do we do about this? What do we do about what people are so comfortably calling ignorance? But as Olivia said, we're in 2022. It, this is this is anti-blackness. It's straight on violence against somebody's um, somebody's identity because of the color of their skin. But yet, you know, uh, also the reality being that the predominant discourse of the diaspora for a lot of us is not represented by the margins from these regions. So when you do sit, you know, with with um, with immigrants, us living abroad in Sydney, many other Western cities, you know, from the US to, to Germany, to, to Australia, to anywhere, um, you know, we, we, we don't look into ourselves. We don't see one another for who we are. And we just see us in relationship with whiteness. We don't see ourselves in relationship with one another. Are we able to see who we are? in the diversity of it, the diversity of its experiences, of its stories, even if it means that it may place the other person in a more, in, a, in an uncomfortable and a conversation they don't want to hear, such as so many folks in my Iranian family, when I would tell them this is racist, this is anti-Black, or friends who are Iranian but not Black, and who I would say, you know, why is it that when you think of being Iranian, you don't think of someone who looks like me, you don't think of someone who, 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 who isn't like what the concept of what folks think Iranian is like all this entrenched, you know, anti-blackness sentiment or, or being perpetrated and passed on, you know, Turkey, Iran, so many of the countries from the region went for, for westernization of their country, you know, like Atatürk took care of it, make sure that people write Latin and no longer the formal way, like they changed the way they dress, like we're not addressing our, uh, our inner, you know, uh, anti-blackness and we're just saying you know so much racism in the west it's the west and also by saying the west we're raising black folks in the west so when i hear western feminism i think of audrey lord personally i don't know who people are talking about when they say western feminism but i think of audrey lord black lesbian feminist i think of of my own jello i think of tony morrison i think of 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 so many black individuals uh, from all over the world. I think of folks from Brazil, from, uh, I think of folks from African countries. I mean, this, we're no longer in the West, but if we stay in the West, there's a lot of black thinkers. You know, when we talk about Western feminism, we should be precise. We should see the intersection. We're talking about white feminism when we talk about Western feminism. Let's not erase, you know, um, uh, all these incredible radical work done by, Black Western feminism that has enabled conversations to move forward for us, you know, in parts like uh, in the Middle East, for example, where Black women, Black feminism in Morocco, in Tunisia, Black feminism in, in India, Black feminism in, in Afghanistan is discarded. And I can tell you that it exists. There are advocates, there are folks, thinkers, but they're just we're just talked about we're not centered to talk for ourselves with our agency like i'm doing today so i think um what olivia brings the, the reason why in morocco we still people are still oddly and very racistly confused about the fact whether or not it's in the arab world or in the african world the same reasoning applies to tunisia applies to algeria applies to egypt egypt a lot of the egyptian culture actually identifies way more with, uh, with, and but you know what it is to identify with the Arab world. The Arab world is black too. So it's what are we doing with this kind of references? You have Arab folks who are black, anyways, and who are African too. So it's it's truly at some point a cacophony when you are this intersection to hear folks talk about it because they always erase a segment of who we are, and it just shows how we're all products of this larger system of white supremacy and and so forth and i could i could really go on because we talked about christian christianity but we don't talk about islam we don't talk about islam and the way that we had slave markets around mecca why don't we talk about this about the fact that african folks were purchased around mecca and were immediately called hajj because anybody who's been to mecca gets the the, the title of hajj and they would force that title on african enslaved folks uh, upon their purchase why don't we talk about the fact that 
darker skinned Africans were sold for less than lighter skinned Africans by Arab slave traders, by Persian slave traders. Like we need to say those things. And I, I believe that there is a lot of hypocrisy um, you know, when, when in the discourse of decolonizing, when it comes to the intersection where we point fingers to Paris and London and rightfully so, and New York, but we don't point fingers towards them ourselves and the systems that as a result were born out of all these uh, of supremacy, white supremacy, I'll stop, I could go on. Thank you, Priscilla and Huda. Um, I want to let you in in a moment, and I just want to remind everybody um, uh, in the audience to, if you have questions are, that are starting to come up, to please click the Q and A button at the bottom of the screen to submit your question. Um, and uh, Huda, I'll turn it back over to you, and then I have a question of my own after. Thank you, Priscilla. And I actually wanted to um, acknowledge that um, the fact that white feminism and Western feminism and the disparity and also the nuances within Western feminism and the identities that lie within it, that needs to be acknowledged. And I think that's, I'm, I'm not sure if I made a slip up, but there is a difference between white feminism and Western feminism. And I'm glad that Priscilla mentioned that and um, even within Western feminism, whether it is black feminism, whether it is South Asian feminism, brown feminism, there are different nuances and different intersections as well. And there needs to be more conversation about how we, we're already stuck in the structure, right? But how are we contributing or elaborating it or how are we adding to it? And I can only speak from my background growing up and um, from a Pakistani background and from a Muslim background, um, there is not enough conversation surrounding the slave trade where Muslims actually played a huge role. And apart from the huge role that they played, there is this um, passive dismissal, almost like an uncomfortable dis dismissing of it. And if you speak to Pakistani Muslims about it, there will be some ridiculous, literally ridiculous justification about it. And um, it's all covered up and hidden under culture and religion and all these different notions. And considering Pakistan is also the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, you can't go above and beyond a certain point. There are certain points where it saying certain things or expressing certain things can be criminalized. So you have to sort of bite your tongue and be mindful as well. So navigating in those systems is so difficult. And also Priscilla mentioned Bollywood and uh, Indian movies, um, Hindi movies, even Tamil movies, and uh, even Pakistani cinema. And even if you Google and go on YouTube and check out Pakistani dramas, um, I think there's probably like 50 layers of foundation just to make the actor appear whiter and light skinned. And having been on sets where friends worked, their body was also covered in foundation to make them appear lighter. There is this inherent self-hatred that um, uh, I can speak on behalf of the Brown community that the Brown community has. I've also seen a difference of treatment, whether it's um, much lighter skinned siblings or darker skinned siblings, uh, the way my father has been treated because he has much, much, much darker skin. And the way he's been spoken of, even in family circles, where my mother is light skinned and my father is dark skinned. And the way, the conversation surrounding it, there's nobody that stands up and says, hey, this is like completely inappropriate. And this is colorism. Uh, there's, there's just laughs surrounding it and they're just small jokes. And it even affects in our culture, the marriage prospects, um, the shadi prospects that girls have. And even if they fall within wheatish and dark, it's horrible because there's literally um, like a, a, how do you put it? Like a color scale card, like a shade card that you have. And if you fall uh, beneath that shade card, apparently you're not marriageable. And they don't want you to actually go ahead and have babies. They always want their sons to have lighter skinned brides, brides that have Western features. This is so problematic. And I am so glad that Priscilla brought this up because our community is, is it's, it's full of it. 
left, right, center, even our dramas, our movies, um, the way we talk, and even the household I grew up in, a lot of colorism, a lot of discrimination. And the saddest part is people don't talk about it enough. The one good thing that I've started seeing, but it's not enough at all, I think, is also that, like Priscilla mentioned, that there are nuanced identities and intersect intersectional identities too. Pakistan also has a history of Africans and it has a history of Black Pakistanis as well. And it has a history of migration and movement as well. People don't really talk about these things much. And I think the problem is us. We need to bring these conversations forward. We need to be okay with being uncomfortable and saying, okay, I kind of messed up here. Maybe I could do better. And that lack of humility and also the superiority, of, especially within the Muslim community I've experienced, there is a sense of superiority that Muslims have that their religion is above and beyond. And there is no acknowledgement for other spiritual leanings and faiths. Being a Pakistani and also being very close to in Middle Eastern circles and international communities, there is also a lot of discrimination by the Arabs um, and I've also noticed this towards South Asians that come from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. They see us as just labor. They speak to us to, um, with tones of dismissal. And I think this is the first time I'll actually say this on a very public platform. My whole school life, I was made fun of just for having an Indian Pakistani background. Um, and these were all Arab students. These were all Arab counterparts. And the most important thing, very, very light skinned, very Western appearing colleagues, apparently who call themselves Muslim. I was not allowed to be part of that circle because I was not Arab enough. I was not Muslim enough for them. So talking about these things is very important and acknowledging um, the mess we have also created among ourselves, the non, the non-white communities. It's a mess there as well. So yeah, thank you, Priscilla, for bringing this up. I want to shift us into um, from this identity of all of the pieces and lenses, these intersections we've been talking about, very, very diverse pieces, but all around this identity of of anti-Blackness, of white supremacy, of sovereignty, and shift us into um, the idea of decolonizing law. What does this mean to you? What is needed to decolonize law? Like, in this is something that I have seen in following No White Saviors in your work, um, uh, Alasso, Olivia, and, and uh, Robert Okot, that, uh, as well as, as many others in the uh, Iranian community of uh, we need to raise the voices of the individuals themselves facing the issues. We do not need to bring America into the conversation of saving. We do not need to um, uh, take the action that is centering ourselves as white individuals. But I know many in the audience as well um, have some questions already coming in asking about this sort of, okay, but then, then what do we do? And for people who might not be as familiar with these conversations, I'd like to hear your ideas of, okay, what is needed for decolonizing law? What, what are some of the steps? What are we asking for? Uh, uh, to address some of these issues and or what's wrong with those questions? Thank you, Jacqueline, uh, for that question. Um, first and foremost, I would love, um, I know Robert Jane back, but I would love to let people know um, that if we're talking about decolonization, uh, my baby just spoke to this song. <laughs> if we are talking about the colonization, the future, the future has, has arrived. <laughs> Let him stay. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome, Alasso, to bring them into. Uh, <laughs> so I was saying that um, people listening in, when we talk about the 
decolonization, we are pointing to something. There's something happening. Why are we even talking about this conversation of decolonizing law? Why we should be asking that question? And we need to understand that the reason why we are arriving at decolonization is because there's coloniality. <coughs> there's been colonization on, on the African continent and different parts of the world. So we are acknowledging that colonization happened. And we are saying that there is still coloniality happening. And that is where we're heading to decolonizing. So if we're going to look at decolonizing, then we have to go back and understand the effects of colonization. The continuity of colonization right now, it's still happening. For example, if we're talking about decolonizing law, I'll start by something very simple that happens in my country, that in Uganda, and I know Robert can also add on to that, in Uganda, our judges are still wearing the white wigs from the British, you know, colonial in free system. Too, in Freetown too, just to add to your, to your point. <laughs> yes, so there's still coloniality. And so if we are going to talk about decolonization, then we need to address, we need to challenge colonization, the effects of colonization. We need to talk about abolishing things if we're going to talk about decolonizing law. What this law is built on a system that is full of exploitation, oppression, and all those things. So if we're even decolonizing the law, then we need to abolish that system because the law is running around, you know, this whole concept of white supremacy. Like we, for example, Americans, you, you, you put yourself as the greatest nation in the world, you know, and you see that hierarchy, you powerful nation in the world. So if we're talking about decolonization, how are we even going to, how, how is America even going to drop from where it is up there to come to the table? It is, it is something that is really hard. So if you're talking about the decolonial journey, we need to, we need to acknowledge that there is colonialism, there is coloniality, and what are we doing to address those aspects, even before um, jumping onto this journey of decolonizing. But I love the fact that we have reached this point, that such conversations have come into play of decolonizing, but we need to decolonize each and everything. You know, for me personally, when you talk about decolonization, I need to decolonize the fact that I'm speaking English. Can I speak my local language to all of you here? Because <laughs> it starts there. It's where we have to start. Even the fact that we're talking about decolonization and I'm still speaking the colonizer's language, I'm still speaking English that has been forced, you know, from my childhood in schools, then that is also something to really think about. So this whole system, we have to destroy the system that, that is built on all those aspects. But also acknowledging that this conversation is taking us somewhere because when you look at the likes of the Martin Luther King, Fred Hampton, all those people wanted at least this space to come to light, wanted to see these conversations out here being discussed, you know, people of different backgrounds, people of different dresses around the world. So on this, for me, I feel that if we're going to um, decolonize law, we need to start with the little, little things like, for example, in Uganda, um, we have so many streets named after white people, British people. We have so many national parks. We have so many lakes named Lake Victoria. It was named after the Queen of England. It doesn't make sense for me at, at this point in my life. So we say if we're going to even decolonize the law because law is something that is, you know, policies and what they're almost in every sphere of our community and in, in our different countries. So we have to start with the small, small things as we uh, embark on to work on yourself. First, decolonize yourself, and then we get to this point. I know Robert has something to add. Please come to the space and contribute so that we give time to other people. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh,
uh, Olivia. But to answer that question, first of all, we need to understand that the impression that was created was that pre-colonial communities did not have laws. Yet, in actual sense, pre-colonial communities had laws and dispute resolution mechanisms that could have been even much better than what the colonizer brought. But again, what we need to know or to remember is that the colonizer needed to import, to export their laws here for them to be able to exploit these colonized nations. So you realize that the law became a tool for the colonizer to continue dominating the colonized. I'll give you an example. For in Uganda, uh, the colonizers introduced what they call the Witchcraft Act, which was in essence trying to limit the practice of traditional medicine because it came up with punishments that involved banishing people that were seen to be practicing traditional medicine. But what is the purpose of this is to create a crisis of identity within the colonized. The good thing is that we have seen Ugandan courts progressively decolonizing the laws. For instance, that act, some, most of its provisions were declared unconstitutional. And that is one way of decolonizing our laws. But the other way, again, would be to look at how we continue engaging communities in making them understand that some of these things are not ours. Because you see that most of the laws that we got from our colonizers were an import from their home or local laws from their own countries to ours, which is akin to uh, transplanting an oak tree from Robert, no could do we lose you there for a moment? I think it froze. Yeah, I think the internet where he is, the internet where he is now, the bandwidth is it's it's evening time in Uganda and people and uh, so I, I can I can I can uh, jump in so by the time he comes back perhaps he can finish. please just, please oh he's back is he back I don't know I just saw something happen go ahead Priscilla and when Robert gets reconnected I mean I, I I think both of you have already answered a lot of the question I think truly what uh, what Robert was explaining about um, how laws uh, where 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 that the intention of having a rule of law comes from. You know, I went to law school. I became a lawyer, and I I sat in in classrooms in the U.S. in France where I studied law with students wanted to do different. Wanted and they thought about you know doing public public becoming public defenders, especially a lot of black and brown kids studying law in the U.S. My, my experience was in New York. The, a lot of the answer to how do we go about, you know, using law for those who suffer from it is to become a public defender. But then you become a public defender and you realize that you're a part of a system that's also in its own way going after, you know, those you're coming to defend. Um, I think what's important to not trick ourselves with 
is to know that the legal system was not created for those who suffer history. The legal system was created for those who, who are powerful, for those who want to hold on to their resources and their power and ensure that others don't necessarily have access. That's what law is. And if we come in thinking that law actually is here for the people where we're being, where, where we, I don't know, we haven't read enough or something because there is um, so many, uh, you, right now, what's happening in Iran right now? Like, where is this entire system of law that, you know, I studied um, in all these different law schools and international, this and that, human rights, this and that. We realize that it's, it's, it's applied and understood in ways that doesn't center people, center politics, it center profits, it center, you know, um, hegemony, it center supremacy, like depending on who it is, which countries are involved, what is at stake geopolitically, all these different factors coming to play when truly what we should do is center people's stories. What my advice to anybody who's a lawyer is to always center people's story. And when I say people, I mean those who suffer from history, centering their stories, listening with empathy radically without projecting who we think they are. But by listening with, you know, I mean, truly, we don't, we don't really execute radical empathy and radical listening anymore. We just listen to someone thinking about, especially attorneys, what is it that I'm going to respond you know, because I should be able to counter this and counter that. And we don't even listen to what people are actually saying. I, I believe that, you know, to be, to use the law for people, we should approach every single conversations with people from the posit that I don't know anything. I don't know this person. I don't know what they come from. I don't know where, which country I've never been there. Even though I saw it on CNN, you know, doesn't make me an expert more so the, the experts are the people who carry the stories. So if we listen to people's story, we realize how much oppression is there. Then we can start thinking of radical ways to dismantle the systems of oppression that also have been, you know, pushed onto other societies and communities. So to me, it's the intention, you know, why am I here? Why do I do what I do? Is it just to pay off my student loans and then buy myself with a mortgage, a nice house and a nice car? Or am I doing this because I want to bring radical change so that my kids are fighting another battle, not the same battle. And, you know, in, in Africa, we went through, in most of African countries, we went through, you know, hundreds of years of subjugation, of oppression, of that we can call, you know, colonization, but truly it was subjugation, oppression, it was, it was kidnappings, it was, let's name it, because sometimes also the word colonization just covers everything. It's just that thing, you know, there was the colonizer, the color. It almost um, cauterized everything. It almost sterilized everything. But truly what was happening was mass kidnappings, sexual exploitation, disappearances. Uh, these are serious human rights violations, genoc genocidal violations. No one, absolutely no one was ever held accountable for it. And I can name you other human rights crises in the world namely those that happened in, the, in Europe, the, the first, second world war and the second uh, world war, when they were as accountability, we had the Nuremberg, the Nuremberg trials, you know, we had uh, after the first world war, I mean, we've all been taught this, this at school in all our colonized curriculum, right? That there's been all these different like systems in place. There's been mm, a, a very hastened international court put together, throwing experts from quote unquote from deep, different parts of the world to come and solve all people's problem. But when it comes to the systems of oppression that Black folks and African folks and Indigenous folks have suffered for centuries, all we have is Independence Day. Right? That's all we have. We go on the street. Oh yeah, we've uh, independence. But when did we do the decolonization? When did we bring consciousness? as to what happened to us. We sit in our schools, nobody's teaching us about what has happened. Nobody's teaching us that when something happens to our bodies, there should be accountability. So we're raising children who go to these schools and they tell us, you know, slavery happened 400 years, 500, this happened, that happened. And in no point in time do we tell them, and for accountability, that's what was put in place, right? My kids ask me this, but then what happened? But what about the people who did this? But what about, you know, that children ask these questions because they're raised by a conscious, you know, critically conscious black feminist mother. So they're going to be raising those questions. Probably a lot of people listening have children who don't ask those questions because unfortunately parents raise their children wanting to hide things from them. May not, I should not tell her that. 
I don't know how her psyche is gonna deal with this while children the same age, especially black and brown folks have to go through the experiences that they don't want the children to hear about because he may just, you know, the therapist said, or, you know, no, we have to talk about the realities of the world to one another, you know, and adjust it to how we talk about it with our younger folks so that as they grow their consciousness becomes critical. So when they go sit in law school and they realize that all these international conventions are from Paris and Geneva, but then the international courts are just in Rwanda and this and this and that, but not for Guantanamo, not for George Bush, not for uh, Emmanuel Macron, if you ask me, and not for the Islamic Republic of Iran. And what are we doing? We're mixing up everything, right? We're mixing up everything. And we say, we don't want to do anything in this region because we don't want it to be another you know, Afghanistan or another Suriye. But then it's like, have you talked to the people of Iran? Because if you did, then we wouldn't need your expertise. What do they want? And not even me, because I'm not living in Iran, but people who are living in Iran, the same way people who are living in Uganda, people who are living in Pakistan, they have agency. So what do we do about it? Can we get our agency back and actually exert it fully? You know, so how can I do if I'm not black and brown and indigenous to make sure that those who are, are actually getting their agency, you know, in my everyday life? What is it that I'm forgetting? Who is it that I'm erasing? How do I perpetuate those systems of oppression, especially as a New York, you know, um, uh, I don't forget, I forgot how we even call ourselves, but like registered attorneys and this and that, sitting in so much power in the most, uh, one of the most expensive cities in the world. Uh, what is it that I'm doing when I'm going to catch up with my friends over some drinks to make sure that I am dismantling the systems that when I was sitting in law school, I was so naively thinking I would do all these things. Now I'm just worried about my mortgage. You know, so it's more so like, there's so much we can do. There's so much we can do. And in 2022, to have women of Iran, LGBTQ folks of Iran, today we had an execution. Someone was hung this morning in my country. They hung a 23 year old boy, man, because he protested. Iran has signed all the conventions. You know, most of them. So what do we do? Like, how do we center grassroots? How do we center people's story who suffer from history? How do we make sure that folks who are in New York, we hear from those that we don't see, we hear from those that we don't hear, but they still have a voice instead of always hearing from the same folks, the attorneys, the doctors, the politicians, you know, can I hear from, you know, the person asking me for money by when I go come back with my Starbucks, like, what's his story? Why do I not care about it? I mean, there's so much. We basically need to imagine the way we live with one another. But I know we're running out of time. And I just wanted to make sure I shared these. But to, to give a clear answer, it is about centering others and not self. It is about not projecting what I think I know about others, but rather listening with radical empathy. Thank you so much, Priscilla, and everybody else on the panel. I wish we had more time to continue these conversations, but I want the audience to know we just put a bunch of links into the chat. So try to click the three little dots on the chat, click save chat so you can get back to that later. Otherwise, feel welcome to email me at legallyunconventional at gmail.com and I can send you the links. Uh, but this is not the only conversation we want to be having, and we hope this is a continuing series as part of the Senior Lawyers Committee. Um, it has been an honor to have you all here and be a witness to this conversation. Thank you for everybody attending, and can't wait to share the recording with everyone else. And have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much, Priscilla, Okot Robert, Alasso Olivia, and Hoda. Deep appreciation for you sharing Merci. your words with us. Thank you.